Good morning, church. God is good. And all the time, that is the Lord's nature. We want to thank God this morning for allowing us to come and worship him. The Bible says I was glad when they told me let us go unto the Lord's house. I want to sincerely thank my friend, my colleague, Pastor Kali, for making this home. New life is always a home for me. And I thank you, preacher, for allowing me this Holy Sabbath to share with your saints. I receive greetings, church, from my church in Dallas, Texas, Mount Zion Fellowship Seventh-day Adventist Church. I'm also thankful for Sister Beatrice for making this program for today. May God continue to bless you. Every time when I come to New Life and I see Elder Wangai, I get excited because he doesn't get old. And that's a good thing. May God continue to give you life. I always tell him the first when I see him, I think of the sermon he preached when I was still a student at Barton University. And that sermon touched me to this moment. I know my church family are also watching, worshiping with us, some of them. May they feel welcome at the feet of the Lord. This morning, as I look at the clock, it's 12 o'clock. And I should be done in the next 30 minutes. I always believe and I say, the new beatitude that says, Blessed are the brief, for they shall be invited back. I believe that's why I've been invited back this, this Holy Sabbath. And we thank God. The word that I want to share with you this morning, I've already shared one time with my church family. But I felt that it would be worth sharing it with you here because I believe you are preparing for your evangelistic campaign that we all need to take serious. In my title of the sermon, Just Go. Just Go. I'm privileged to have my little kids here, two of them, as you've been told. I try most often to come with them home so that they can have the love of their motherland. You see, when people tell, tell you that give thanks to the Lord at all times, it's always a loaded statement because personally I thank God that I was born in Africa and grew up in the village and live in the U.S. Because I ask myself sometimes if I was born there, I don't know how life would be. But when I come with my kids, it's always like a movie to me and I love it. The way they behave. It took my daughter or the family to see their grandma in Kisi. They were given, on our way back, they were given two chicken. And when I saw the chicken, the next day I was going to have visitors at my home. And I realized that my mother-in-law saved me some money for, for food. 
But as soon as we left the house, when we were driving back, my daughter said that, Dad, let us not make a mistake of killing this chicken. And I didn't know she was that serious. So when we came home, she ensured that the chicken were put in a safe place. And she literally gave them names. So one is called one, and the other one is called two. The chicken spent the night at the garage in our home. The following day, one laid an egg. And that was very profound. And I saw the excitement that my daughter had when she went to check on them. And she found that the chicken had laid an egg. And so right now we decided to start a chicken farm. And I praise God for my daughter because I didn't make the soup out of her gifts. Yesterday as I was preparing my sermon and my son wanted us to play and I told him son I'm preparing a sermon for tomorrow but he told me dad I thought we were on vacation and then I told him yes son but we have to also preach the word and then he left in protest and you know what he said he said man he was referring to me. And that made me think, if I called my dad man at that age, <laughs> it would have been disastrous. Uh, he said, as he was walking away, he said, man, you are an international preacher. You preach everywhere. And he went. But that was just, a, by the way, I was just bringing your attention to the sum. Just go. Let us pray. Speak to us, my God, for we are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. We will share from two texts, the book of John chapter 13 verses 1 to 15, and the book of Matthew chapter 28 verses 16 to 20. I would like the media people to project that as we go along so that we can be together. Just go. The Bible says in the book of John chapter 13 verses 1 and 5, I mean 1 to 15, and I would want us to read it together. It was just before the Passover feast, Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who are in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. And so he got from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. And after that, he poured water on a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, Peter said, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, unless 
I wash you. You have no part with me. I will pause there. I have heard that it is true how important it is to listen to statements of a dying man. For often it, if not most times, those who are at the edge of their life's journey, those who are coming to the end of their life on this earth, will oftentimes say some important words before they go. I had longed personally, my dad had passed away, and he used to tell me every time when I'm concerned about his health, he told me, son, when my time comes, I will tell you, and I will have some words with you. But unfortunately, my dad died before sharing those words with me. But perhaps this could be true of the last words of Jesus. And I speak not this morning, children of God, about the words he speak last on the cross. For those words are equally important and very powerful. Perhaps above all other words. But this morning, I want to bring your attention to the last conversation that Jesus Christ had with his disciples, a session prior before the cross. Just from the pericope that we've just read in the book of John, chapter 13 from verses 1. Because unless you understand what happens here, you will not understand what he says in chapter 14 going forward. So in John chapter 1, what we have just read, Jesus gathered his disciples together. In verses 1, it says the hour had come for him to depart of this world. He was about to go to the Father having loved his own his own who are in the world, the Bible says. The Bible records that he loved his own to the end. In verses 2 it says that during this supper, this supper that we know as the last supper, the devil had already put in the mind of Judas Iscariot to betray Jesus. And at this last supper, Jesus does something that is very powerful that I want us to understand. Scripture records that he lays aside his outer garment. He took a towel, tied it on his waist. He then fetched a bucket of water and began to wash the disciples' feet. If you are still with me, say yes. He took a towel, he ties it around his waist, he takes a bucket of water, and he begins to wash the feet of his disciple. I believe we all know about this, and we call this the ordinance of humility. The foot washing ceremony. And for us, it has become a ceremony. And there's a great meaning of this ceremony, a great spiritual significance of foot washing ceremony for us. But for Jesus, he performed this not as a ceremony, but he was actually showing us or showing the disciples and to us as well, not just humility, but rather Jesus was trying to show us the kind of ministry he expects of us going forth. 
And we get some insights, children of God, of what he's doing because when he gets to Peter, it is very clear. You see, what Jesus was doing for his disciples, he was showing them that when you are called to be his disciple, when you are called to bring in the sheaves, you are called not to take a title with you, but instead you are called to take a towel with you. I'll say that again. When you are called to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, children of God, you and I, you are called to take not a title with you, but take a towel with you. A towel signifies servant leadership. And when you look back at what Peter says, Peter says and he begins by saying, Lord, and it's right because Jesus Christ is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. But this King of Kings knelt down on the dust, washed the feet of his disciples. And the truth of the matter is, and I understand where Peter is coming from, because what Jesus was doing in normal sense was beneath him. But Peter did not understand that the ministry that we are called into is not about is not about titles, but it's about towels. It is not about how people look up to you, but it is about how we can serve others. Understand New Life Church that even as you prepare for this big campaign you can never be a true disciple if you don't take a towel with you. You can never have an effective discipleship if you don't do servant leadership. Serving people in their lowest forms and in their lowest places. Bringing in the sheaves to the kingdom is not being a ministry leader or being served first at the potluck, but it's about serving people. And Jesus here is trying to show them that it is not about titles. It is not about how much you have in your bank account. It is not how much or how much uh, titles you have behind your name. And when Jesus tells Peter, now listen. Jesus tells Peter that if you don't let me wash your feet, then you have no part in this business. That if you don't let me wash your feet, then you don't have part in this business I'm, that I'm calling you to do. And then Peter says, that Lord, not just my feet, but wash me from the top of my head. And Peter did not really understand that Jesus was not washing him to make him clean. For he says further on in the text when you read in this pericope, he says to Peter that I'm not washing you to make you clean. For you're already clean. But I'm doing this for a purpose. And then after everything that Jesus did, Jesus asked them a question. Do you understand what I have done for you? He told him, you call me teacher. You call me Lord. And you are right. For I am the Lord. And if I, your Lord, would wash your feet, then you ought to wash 
one another's feet. Jesus is saying here, children of God, that yes, I have a title, but my title is beneath me when I'm called to serve humanity. Yes, you may have a title. Yes, you may have all that money in your account. Yes, you may own all those properties. But when it comes to discipleship, when it comes to serving humanity that Christ Jesus has called you and I, those stay behind but carry a towel with you. Jesus says, Blessed are they those who choose to do this thing that I've told you. He continues to say that I'm not speaking to all of you. Maybe later you can read that text. He says, I'm not speaking to all of you. For I know whom I have chosen. And it is here where Jesus is referring to Judas. And he begins to give them some little understanding that one of them is going to betray him. But he never identified the betrayer at that moment. I want you to look at this microscopically. It is at this moment that the grace of Jesus is at work. Notice, if you will, with me, the Bible says that he has washed all their feet. He washes Peter's feet. He washes Thomas's feet. He washes James and John Matthew's feet, which means that he also washed Judas's feet. Thus giving Judas another chance. Another opportunity here at the last moment. To make a decision to change his mind. Because although the Bible says that the spirit had, had, gone, had gotten into him. The spirit had not completely taken over him. Jesus is giving him an opportunity to turn around. The Bible records that Judas had made up his mind. And Judas left. But now Jesus tells him that Judas, whatever you want to do, do it quickly. And then it is here. When you read through verses 31, where the Bible says after Judas had gone out, now Jesus turns to the rest of the disciples. Who are left behind. And watch. What the Lord is saying. He says. Now. The son of man. Is glorified. And God is glorified in him. Verse 33 says. Little children. Yet in a little while. I will be with you. But where I am going, you cannot go. Jesus, in fact, is referring to them that is getting ready to go to the cross. And after the cross, he's going to rise. And he's going to ascend to his father and go to the kingdom that he's going to prepare. He begins to unfold the plan that is beyond the cross. And when you look at verses 34, he says, A new commandment I give you. That you love one another. If you'd stop right there, children of God. This is not very hard to do. Because with some little effort... With a lot of little self-control, you can practice love to one another. But that's not what Jesus 
has said here. He says that a new commandment I give you. That you love one another just as I have loved you. There is where it gets heavy. It's one thing to love a person. But it's another thing to love as Jesus loves you. So he tells them a new commandment I've given you. This is not a regular kind of love, children of God. This is not the kind of love that you can just strive enough to attain. And I want you to catch what Jesus is trying to say because he was telling all the disciples and instructing them on this. I know that you are preparing for this crusade. And Pastor Kali has said that at least one member should come with at least five people. Bringing in the sheaves is a gospel commission. When you read the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you will realize that the great commission is always preceded by the commandment of love. Jesus says that you've got to love one another. And you've got to love one another just as Jesus loves you. Because if we cannot love one another as Jesus loves, then we cannot make disciples. You've got to love one another as Jesus loves. Let me paint a picture. When Jesus says this, remember, Judas has just left out. And the Bible says that the disciples did not know what Jesus meant when he said to Judas that Judas, whatever you do, do it quickly. In fact, other scholars say that they thought that Jesus was either sending him out for some errands to bring something for the feast or perhaps to run some errands for the poor. They did not know that the Judas left out and he was leaving to betray Jesus. So when Jesus says that you've got to learn to love one another the way I have loved you, he's including Judas. In other words, what Jesus is saying that you've got to love even those who betray you. You've got to love even those who don't love you back. You've got to love even those who plan evil things against you. May I suggest this morning? Maybe it's just me. I'm on the one, maybe I'm the only one who believes that this is impossible. Because for me, in my own power, in my own strength to learn to love and not get back is not easy. You see, in life, there are people that we interact with that are just naturally lovable. There are people that when you interact with, they just bring positive energy. There are people when we inter interact with, just bring joy into our lives. But if I could push it further and get real, there are people even that we worship with. That you may not feel like loving. But Jesus calls us to love just as I love you. To love even your betrayer. To love even those who plan evil against you. Oh my God. We need some help here. And I can tell that this is hitting hard the way you look at me.
what I'm trying to tell you this morning, church, is that we will never be real disciples for Jesus. We will never be able to bring in the sheaves to the kingdom of God unless we love as Jesus has, has instructed us. And the only way that we can achieve this is that we need the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in our personal lives. So Jesus says that the first step to be a disciple maker if you receive the power of the Holy Ghost then you will start to love even those who do not love you. And through that people who do not know the Lord People who do not know the love of God will see how you love and will say, how can I get some of what you're doing? Love as Jesus loves. You cannot do that unless the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is in our lives. The book of Matthew chapter 28 verses 16 to 21, the Bible records the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded me. And surely, I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is a reminder to us. And this command that Jesus gave, the last commandment that Jesus gave, should be the priority of our church. By the time we read this pericope in Matthew, you will realize that the death, the resurrection, the burial of Jesus Christ has already taken place. And all that is left for Matthew's gospel to report is the promised post-resurrection. The reunion between Christ and his disciples. And here is a summary that we have in verses 16 and 17. The Great Commission. Now understand here that the 11 disciples are here. Judas is now excluded. And they went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And the Bible records that when they saw him, they fell on their faces down to worship him. But some doubted. In verses 18 through 20, Jesus approaches his disciples and issues what we call the Great Commission. But I want you briefly to get the tension that is between the setting of this Great Commission and the statement of the Great Commission, if you will. The disciples here are waiting for some unidentified pre-appointed Galilean at the hillside. When they see the resurrected Jesus approaching them, the Bible says that when they saw him, 
They fell on their face in worship, but some doubted. Feel with me the tension that is between this setting. But yet Jesus continues to approach them. And Jesus continues to entrust them with this great commission to the world. Oh, I don't know about you. But that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But that could be a great way for a worldwide movement to be commissioned. With no decorations. But yet we find here Jesus is using sinful, finite man, and if you will, if I say you and me, to be the messengers of his word to the whole world. With no money, with no fanfare, with no programs, with no fancy buildings, he's charging these men to be his witnesses to the world. The early church took this mission so seriously that in Acts chapter 17 verses 16 we are told that when they arrived in the city of the Salonica, the local said referring to these men that these are the men who have turned the world upside down. But I want to tell you New Life Church and I stand here before you to declare that the gospel of Jesus Christ still has the power to turn the world upside down. And the Lord Jesus Christ is still willing to use weak people like you and me to be the witnesses of him to the world. We must be on mission as a church. We must not lose sight of what the Lord Jesus Christ has called you and I to do. We must ensure that this generation, the generation that we live in, should have this great commission and not the great omission. I'll say that again. We must ensure that we keep this great commission and not the great omission. What does this mean to be on mission? I'm glad you ask. Believe the claim that Jesus makes. The great commission begins in verses 18 with a bold declaration from the Lord. When he says, sovereign authority is of the Lord Jesus Christ. The record says in verses 18 may not be meaningful. The commission rests on the claim. Verses 18 may not be true if you don't get the previous verse. And the great commission begins with a bold declaration when Jesus says all authority in heaven and on earth is given unto me. Jesus indeed has the power to make everything possible in our life. You see, power by definition is the ability to get things done. But the authority, on the other hand, is the jurisdiction. It's the freedom. It's the legal rights to use the power. That's what Jesus claims here. That all authority in heaven and on earth is given unto him. Not just omnipotent power, but sovereign authority. I never love talking about my wife. But I find myself talking about my wife when I speak. And usually when we get back home, things are not very smooth. But I tell her that it's the Holy Spirit. I love watching basketball. 
And it took me some time to realize that when I'm seated, I'm a fan of Lakers. And during NBA season, I spent a lot of time watching TV. But it took me some time that when I settle to watch my game, my wife will always distract me. And they say, would you, would you vacuum the other room? And then I would go do the vacuuming. And then I go sit back and wait. And then she would say, oh, would you kind of wash the garage? It took me some time to realize. I did not know that my time with NBA was not very pleasant to her. Because sometimes I would do, I try to organize everything and settle my time and then she would come with some chores. And one day I told her that, you know, I understand that you are not a fan, but it would be better for you to support me. So the only way she supported me was to, when we were playing, she would always oppose the other team. You see, in basketball, or in the sports world, great athletes have the power to move the ball around the field. To move it up from one court to the other. But the referee has the authority to, re to restrict, or to penalize, or to disqualify the athlete power. The athlete may have a big fan base. The athlete may have great skills. The athlete may have a huge contract. But all that the referee has is just but a whistle. But the authority of the referee triumphs the ability of the athlete. The authority of the referee in the sports world, children of God, Jesus claims the entire world, the entire heaven, and the entire earth. But the authority of Jesus Christ has no protest, has no instant replay, has no commissioner's ruling that can overrule the authority of Jesus Christ. All authority and power has been given unto me in heaven and on earth, Jesus says. And I want you to notice the scope of his authority. And the scope of his authority is just summarized in one word. All. In other words, no one else has that authority. So Jesus says, see when you read the book of Acts chapter 1 verses 8, the disciples, he tells the disciples that you will, you will receive the power of the Holy Ghost. And you shall be witnesses for me in Jerusalem, in Samaria, in all corners of the earth. And here in Matthew 28, we have the great Christological statements of the New Testament. This is unmistakable claim, children of God. A claim that permits no middle ground when Jesus says that all authority and power has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. You cannot walk away from that and simply conclude that Jesus is just one of the prophets. Either he's a liar or he's a lunatic or he's the Lord of all. And our mission in the world begins by believing the claim that Jesus makes that all authority is in fact his and this authority is been given to him by his father in heaven and on earth. So 
So this authority says we can claim it. You see, personally, I never walk into my house and my wife is here, she can testify. I've never said the statement in my house that I'm, I'm the man of this house. If you, walk, if you walk around in your house, or ladies, you can just close your ears for a second. That man, if you walk around the house and tell the, the people in the house that I'm the man of this house, that probably means you're not. <laughs> but is that the case with Jesus? He proclaims all authority, but is that true? For one can easily conclude that it is not when you look at it around the world today. But I want to submit to you, New Life Church, this afternoon that do not question the claim of Jesus Christ based on the breaking news of the world today. Do not question the authority of Jesus Christ based on what you are going through in your personal life. Do not question the authority of Jesus Christ based on the trials that your children are going through. The proof of this claim is true. Because Jesus lived to make this claim. Jesus himself was betrayed Jesus himself was arrested. Jesus himself was tried. He was convicted. He was beaten and crucified. But God raised him from the dead. And the resurrected Jesus declares now. That all authority. In heaven. And on earth. Has been given. Unto me. This declaration children of God is in fact a declaration of war against the enemies of Jesus. The reason Jesus has been given this authority. And the first question, then concerning this great commission, is a personal one. That we must believe the claim of this authority. But at the same time, the next thing, we must obey it. When Jesus says, go therefore, to make disciples of all nations. You see a disciple by definition. Is one that follows rabbi. A disciple by definition. Is one that wants to learn and be like him. So Jesus bids his disciples. And tells them with this assignment. To make disciples of all nations. And that should be our priority as the church we are to call lost people children of God to repent their sins to run to the cross and trust the righteous blood of Jesus Christ for salvation of the wrath of God that is yet to come and to follow Jesus as the Lord of our lives this is not just a call for the few but it's a call for all of us. The task of making disciples is done by going. And I'm glad that the word go comes before the gospel. Note that Jesus is not telling the world to come to church, but rather he's bidding the, the church to go to the world. To go to the world for this coming Christ. To go to the world and witness the second coming of our king. And Jesus says, as you go, make disciples. Make disciples. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to obey all these things that I've commanded you. And Lord, or surely I will be with you to the end of the age. New Life Church, just believe and go. May God bless you. Let us pray. 
our master, our creator, our redeemer. We thank you, my God, because you have given us the privilege as we've worshipped you. Father, I pray that the words that have come from you through me, my God, may have meaning to each and every soul that is represented here. May we live here knowing that soon and very soon you are coming to take your kingdom home. It is my prayer, my God, that all of us can submit fully to thy Holy Spirit, that your Spirit can allow us to love one another as you've loved us. For this is the only way that we can meet this assignment that you've given us to go and make disciples for your kingdom. When you come to take your kingdom home, oh my Father, it is my prayer and my desire that all of us may find our names in that book of life. That even when, if our time on this earth passes before you come, may we live on this earth saying, to you that we have fought a good fight waiting for our king to come and take us home. Bless us for the rest of the program for in Jesus name I pray. Amen.